Oh guys, today we're going to be reading Hatchet by Gary Paulson. Yeah, there's something wrong. That guy had it too. That guy's so sure how to do it. Sorry about that. Chapter 1. Brian Robeson stared out the window of the small plane. At the endless green northern wilderness below, it was a small plane, a Cessna 406, a bush plane, and the engine was so loud, so roaring and consuming and loud that it ruined any chance for conversation. Not that he had much to say. He was 13, and the only passenger on the plane was a pilot named, what was it, Jim or Jake or something, who was, who was in his mid-40s and who had been silent as he, as he worked to prepare for takeoff. In fact, since Brian had come to the small airport in Hampton, New York, to meet the plane driven by his, other, by his mother, the pilot had only spoken five words to him, get in the co-pilot seat. When Brian had when Brian had done, which Brian had done, they had taken off, and that that was the last of conversation they had. But had they, there had been the initial excitement, of course. He had never flown in a single engine plane before, and to be sitting in the co-pilot seat with all the controls right there in front of him, all the in instruments in his face, as the plane clawed for attitude, jerking and sliding on the wind currents as the pilot took off, had been interesting and exciting but in five minutes they had leveled off at six thousand feet and headed north northwest and from then on the pilot had been silent staring out the front and the drone of the engine had been all that was left the drone and the sea of the green trees that laid before the plane's nose and flowed to the horizon spreading with spread with lakes swamps and wandering streams and rivers now brian sat looking out the window with the war, war thundering through his ears, and try to catalog what had led up to his taking this flight. The, the thinking started. It, it, always it started with a single word, divorce. It was an ugly word, an ugly word, he thought, a tearing, ugly word that meant fighting and yelling lawyers God, he thought, how he hated lawyers who sat there with their comfortable smiles and tried to explain to them in legal terms how all that he lived and was co coming apart and the breaking and shattering. All of the solid things, his home, his life, all the solid things, divorce, the breaking word, an ugly word, divorce, secrets, no, not secrets, so much as just a secret, what he knew and had not told anybody, what he knew about his mother that had caused the divorce, what he knew, what he knew, the secret, divorce, the secret. Brian felt his eyes beginning to burn, and he knew there would be tears. He had cried for a long time, but that was gone now. He didn't cry now. Instead, his eyes burned. And tears came, the sweeping, the tears that burned, but he didn't cry. He came, he wiped his eyes with a finger and looked at the pilot out of the corner of his eye to make sure he, had, he hadn't noticed the burning in tears. The pilot sat large, his hands lightly on the wheel, feet on the rudder pedals. He seemed more a he seemed, seemed more a machine than a man. An extension of the plane on the dashboard in front of him. Brian saw the dials and switches, mirrors, knobs, levers, cranks, lights, handles that were wiggling and flickering, all indicating nothing that he understood. And the pilot seemed the same way. Part of the plane not human. When he saw Brian look at him, the pilot seemed to open up a bit and smiled. Ever fly in the co-pilot seat before? I'll be right back, everybody. Wait, just on camera? Oops, sorry. He leaned over and lifted the headset off his right ear and put it on his temple, yelling to overcome the sound of the engine. Bro Brian shook his head. He had never been in any kind of plane, never seen the co <sighs> never seen the cockpit of a plane except in films or television. In television, it was loud and confusing first time. It's not as complicated as it looks. Good plane like this almost flies itself, the pilot shrugged. Makes my job easy. He took Brian's left arm. There, here, put your hands on the controls, your feet in the rudder pedals, and I'll show you what I mean. 
Brian shook his head. I'd better not. Sure, try it. Brian reached reached out and took the wheel in his in a grip so tight his knuckles were white. He pushed his feet down on the pedals. The plane sl slewed suddenly to the right. Not so hard. Take her le left. Take her light. Take her light. Brian eased off, relaxing his grip. The burning in his eyes were forgotten momentarily as the bright vibration of the plane came through the wheel and the pedals. It seemed almost alive. See? The pilot let go of his wheel, raising his hands in the air and took off it took his feet off the pedals to show Brian he Brian he was actually flying the plane alone. Simple. Now turn the wheel a little right a little to the right and push on the right rudder pedal a small amount. Brian turned the wheel slightly and the plane immediately baked to the right and when he crossed on the right rudder pedal, the nose slid across the horizon to the left. He left off on the pressure and strained the wheel and the plane righted, righted itself. Now you can turn. Brian, her, bring her back to the left to, to the left a little. Brian turned the wheel left, pushed on the left pedal and the plane came back around. It's easy, he smiled at least this part. The pilot nodded, nodded. All of flying is easy. Just takes, it just takes learning, like everything else. Like everything else, he took, he took the controls back, then reached up and hit, rubbed his left shoulder. Aches and pains must be getting old. Brian let go of the controls and moved his feet away. The pedals as the pilot put his hands on the wheel. Thank you, but the pilot had put his headset back on the, gratitude was lost in the engine noise and things went back to Brian looking out the window of the ocean and tr of trees and lakes the burning eyes did not come back but memories did come flooding in the words always the words divorce the secret fight split the big split Brian's father did not understand Brian did only knew only the, the that Brian's mother Wanted to break the marriage apart. The spit had come, and then divorce all so fast. And the court had left him with his mother, except for the summers, and when the judge called visitation rights so formal, Brian hated judges as he hated lawyers. Judges that leaned over the bench and asked Brian if he understood where he was to live, and why judges was the caring, with the caring look that meant every, nothing as lawyers said legal phrases that meant nothing. In the summer, Brian would lift, would live with his father in the school year with his mother. That's why the judges said, after looking at the papers on his desk and listening to the lawyers talk, talk words. Now the plane lurched slightly to the right, and Brian looked at the pilot. He was rubbing his shoulder again, and there was sudden smell of body gas in the plane. Brian turned back to avoiding embarrassment, embarrassing the pilot, who was obviously in some discomfort, must have stomach troubles. So this summer. The first summer when he was allowed to have visitation hours with his father, with the divorce only one month old, Brian was heading north. His father was a mechanical engineer who had designed or invented a new drill, bit for oil drilling. <sighs> I God, I don't want to die. Sweating. I'm I'm pale. I'm dying. Bro. Oh. See, this is why I can't do videos. If I have anxiety and death anxiety and I'm paranoid, I cannot make god damn videos a self-cleaning self-sharpening bit it was working in the oil fields of canada up on the tree line where the tundra started and the forest ended brian was riding up from new york with some drilling equipment my throat hurts i'm telling you yeah i'm fine if i die then i'll die it was lashed down in the rear of the plane, next to a fabric bag the pilot had called a survival pack, which had emergency supplies in case they had to make an emergency landing. They had to be specially made in the city, riding in the bush plane with the pilot named Jim or Jake or something, who had turned out to be an alright guy, letting him fly and all. Except for the smell, now there was a constant odor, and Brian took another look at the pilot, finding him rubbing the, rubbing the, the shorter down the arm now. The left arm, letting go more gas than wincing. Probably something he ate, Brian thought. His mother had driven him from the city to meet the plane at Hampton, where it came to pick up the drilling equipment. I drive in silence, a long drive in silence, two and a half hours of sitting in the car, staring out the window. Once after an hour, when they were out of the city, she turned to him. Look, can we talk this over? Can't we talk this out? Can't you tell me what's bothering you? And then the words again, divorce, split. The secret he could tell her that he could tell her that what he tell her what he knew. So he had remained silent. 
how could he tell her what he knew? So he had kept silent, shook his head and continued to stare unseeing at the countryside, and his mother had gone back to driving only to speak to him once more time. To speak to him one more time. When they came were close to Hampton. She reached over the back of the back uh, of the seat and brought up a paper sack. I got something for you for the trip. Brian took the sack and opened the top. Inside there was a hatchet, the kind of the kind with a steel handle and a rubber hand grip. The hand was in a stout leather case that had brass riveted belt loop. It goes on your belt, his mother spoke now without looking at him. There were some farm trucks on the roads now, and she had to weave through them and watch traffic. The man at the store said said you could use it, you know, in the woods with your father. Dad, he thought, not my father. My fa my dad. Thanks, it's really nice, but the words sounded hollow, even to Brian. Try it on, see how it looks on your belt. And he would normally have said no. But normally I said no, that it looked too hockey to have a hatchet on your belt. Those were the normal things he, what he would say. But her voice was thin. He had sounded like something thin would break if you touched it. And it felt bad for not speaking to her, knowing what he knew. Even with the anger that the white hot, the white hate of his anger at her, he still felt bad for not speaking to her. And so to humor her, to humor her, he loosened his belt and pulled the right side out and put the hatchet on and rethreaded the belt scooch around so I can see. Be right back, everybody. Here it goes. He moved around in the seat, feeling only slightly ridiculous. She nodded, just like a scout, my little scout, and there was the tenderness in her voice that she had when he was small, the tenderness that she had been when he was small and sick with a cold, and she put her hand on her forehead, and the burning came into his eyes again. He had turned away from her mother and looked out the window, forget, forgetting, forgotten the hatchet on his belt so and so the arrived at the plane with the hatchet still on his belt because it was a bush flight from a small airport 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 there had been no security on the plane had been waiting the had been no security on and the plane had been waiting with the engine running when he arrived and he grabbed his suitcase and pack and a pack bag and ran for the plane without stopping to remove the hatchet so it was still on his belt. At first he had been embarrassed, but the pilot had said nothing about it, and Brian forgot as he took off and began flying. More smell now. Bad. Brian had turned again to glance at the pilot. He had been both hands on his stomach and was grimacing right, in pain. Reaching for the left shoulder again as Brian watched. Don't know, kid. The pilot's words were a hiss, barely audible. Very aud audible. A bad aches here. Bad aches thought it was something ate, I ate, but he stopped as a fresh spasm of pain hit him. Even Brian could see how it, bad it was. The pain drew the pilot back into the seat, back and down. I never had anything like this. The pilot reached for the switch on his, make, on his mic cord. He had his hand cam, coming up in a small arc from his stomach, and he flipped the switch and said, This is, four, this is flight 4-6, and now a jolt, a jolt took him like a ham ham blow, a hammer blow, so forcefully that he seemed to crush back into his seat, and Brian reached for him, could not understand at first what it was, could not know, and then he knew, Brian knew, the pilot's mouth went rigid, 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 he swore and jerked a short series of slams into the seat, holding his shoulder, now swore and hissed, chest, oh my god, my chest is coming apart, Brian knew now, the pilot was having a heart attack. Brian had been in the shopping mall with his mother when a man in front of the Posey store had suffered a heart attack. He had gone down and screamed about his chest, an old man much older than the pilot. Brian knew the pilot was having a heart attack, and even though it, he, even as the knowledge came to Brian, he saw the pilot slam into the seat one more time. One more awful time, he slammed back into the seat, and his right leg jerked. 
pulling the plane at the side in a sudden twist, and his head fell forward, and spit came spit came from the corners of his mouth, and his legs contracted up, up on into the seat, and his eyes rolled back in his head until there was only white, only white for his eyes, and the smell became worse, filling the cockpit and all of it so fast, so incredibly fast, Brian's mind that Brian's mind could not take it in at first, could only see it in stages. The pilot had been talking just a moment ago, complaining of the pain. He had been talking. Jolt. Probably got to talk it too long. Then the jolts had come. The jolts that took the pilot ba back had come. And now Brian sat there with a strange feeling of silence and the thrumming roar of the engine. A strange feeling of silence and becoming alone. And being alone. Brian was stopped. He was stopped inside. He was stopped. He could not think past what he saw. What he felt. All was, all was stopped. The very core of him. The very center of Brian Robeson was stopped and stricken with a white flash of horror, a, ten, a terror so intense that his breathing, his thickening, and nearly his heart had stopped. Stopped. Seconds passed, seconds that had become all of his life, and he began to know what he was seeing, began to understand that what he saw, and that was worse, so much worse that he wanted to make his mind freeze again. He was sitting in the in a bush plane Warring 7,000 feet above the northern wilderness was a, with a pilot who had suffered a massive heart attack and who was either dead or something close to a coma. He was alone. In the whirring plane with no pilot, he was alone. Alone.